Welcome into the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. It is a Supernatural News Wednesday. We're going to have some fun today. Boy, do we have stories upon stories upon stories. we got to get into it today, and in order to do so, we need a co-host or a co-hostess. So we went out and got the best in the biz. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from the mitten. I know that because um, <laughs> I, I watch a lot of wrestling, and now they got the Motor City machine guns now in WWE, and they do this. They do this thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And 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 so we went to the mitten and went and got the best in the biz, Mally Fox. Hi, Mally. Hello. How you doing? <laughs> I'm just watching you jab your hand. Yeah, I know. Look, if I do this enough, yeah. uh, I might have somebody throw me a baseball. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like that tapping thing that people do to manifest stuff, but you're doing it on your hand rather than your forehead. Do, oh, is that what that is that what that is? Yeah, isn't it like the tapping you do like on certain parts of your body and it's to like and you like repeat stuff and it's supposed to manifest. Really? I need to learn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So really? it's all over YouTube, but yeah. Really? So when you're tapping your hand, it looked like you're almost doing that. <laughs> you should money, be like, money, 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 I money. am manifesting money. Money is coming my my way. <laughs> I deserve money. <laughs> brains, 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 brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. I don't, know. I don't know. Something like that, I guess. Yeah. I, I got to figure, I got to figure that out now. I got a uh -huh. new, I got a new hobby, I guess. Now that, now that yeah. uh, we're only a couple of ways, a uh, couple of days away from the chippers going to sleep. I got to, I got to come up with mm -hmm. hobbies. That means I get to pick up my guitar now. Ooh. Yeah. I got to pick up the guitar now that uh, we're coming up on a uh, deep fall into winter. I got to find stuff to do, I guess. People say, mm -hmm. well, put up the rest of the archive, Tim. I guess I'll do that now too. <laughs> yeah. I got a ukulele as a gift because I was on a one of those weird harebrain ideas on a whim. And so I wanted a ukulele because I wanted to learn Christmas music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got one like 10 years ago. Never taken it out of its case. I need to start learning because I think it would be fun. My nephew wanted one a couple of years mm -hmm. ago for Christmas and he got one. I don't think he's ever touched it either. Yeah. 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 I think I just figure I'm old. Can I learn new habits? You know, can I learn a new trait? You always can. Yeah. It, right. it just, you know what it is, is it, pick it up once a week, just once a week. And yeah. even if you, you know, you learn a chord or two. Right. And you'd be surprised after, you yeah. know, 52 times of picking it up a year. True. If you look at it that way. Yeah. And it's good for your brain. Yep. You'll learn a song. If you do it once yeah. a week and 52 times in a year, you'll learn a song. And if you learn yeah. one song and look at it this way, I mean, you know, what's funny. Uh, okay. Our good friend, Scott Gruenwald, rest in peace. He's mm -hmm. been gone yes. for a little while. Oh yeah. He used to play the uk ukulele. Yes, he did. And he, and what's funny is everybody thought, oh gosh, he could play anything. He mm -hmm. really only knew, I think three or four songs, Oh, <laughs> but he, well, he had all of us full. <laughs> right. But he played, he played the same chords over and over and over again. He just uh -huh. sang different things to the same chords, which I always thought was gotcha. funny, right? He would stand there and he'd play the same, you know, and he just kind of strum and he'd play the same uh -huh. chords, but he would sing different things to the same chords, which I thought was hysterical. It was kind of a musician's <laughs> joke because, right. you know, he would just kind of ding, 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 ding. And then he'd sing whatever to it, right? Uh -huh. And people would go, oh, God, he's brilliant because he's singing all this different stuff and he's playing all this different stuff. It wasn't. It was the same melody, but he was he was singing different things to the same melody. So uh -huh. it was hysterical. That's the, I think that was the inside joke, and he knew that was the inside joke. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was funny. That was the extra layer. Yeah, I never noticed scene. he played the same chords over. Yeah, he did. A lot of times. Yeah. Huh, if you go, there's a lot of his stuff that's still recorded and, and on YouTube. If you go and watch it, he did He did a lot of the same bits. So if you go and watch right. a lot of his bits, it's a lot of the same stuff. Keep Didn't going. he do the naked and paranormal or yes. paranormal and naked or yeah. I don't know, something like that? Yeah. He, he was the forefather of all that stuff. Okay. So like, you know, you have Naked and Afraid out there and all those all right. those game shows and stuff. Uh huh. Scotty was the one who went ghost hunting naked before everybody ever decided to do all that stuff. Because I remember when it was going around that they were trying to create that show and I was like, are you freaking kidding me? And then it ended up being yeah, him. I never watched him. it, but it no. kind of hit his, his yeah. little happy, happy place with a ukulele during an investigation. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and see, he did it as a lark, as, as something right. funny. And 
they're doing as this as a serious thing on network TV, right. which I think is just hysterical. But yeah, no, he's he was yeah. I mean, he was just an innovator. He was just one of a kind, <laughs> just classic. Yeah. So, well, you know what they say, you're never truly gone if they keep your name out there. So that is very true. That's right. So we that can, is very true. We continue to keep Scott Grunewald's name out there. Absolutely. So. All right. With that, uh, today's show, Mally, we have, boy, do we have stories galore out there. Um, and uh, just among some of the ones we have out there, uh, the Netherlands is now encouraging their pilots to report UFO encounters. Uh, they found a mystery implant in those cake mummies <laughs> over in Peru. Oh. <laughs> um, something interesting to keep uh, track mm -hmm. of. Scientists believe they've discovered potential hiding places for alien life on Mars, among other things. In our Nightmare Fuel segment today, there's a new death clock. According to AI, they can tell you now when you're going to die. According to AI, another one, oh, yet another one. So yeah. we'll talk about that. A psychic looking for a man's missing daughter found human remains. We'll talk about that in today's program. Uh, a political candidate wants to make Bigfoot the state animal of Ohio. Huh. So we got a little political news to talk about today in today's program. And we'll wrap it up by telling you why bears aren't the best animal to invite over to your Halloween party. That's all in today's. That'd be a given. <laughs> well, but that that will wrap up today's uh, supernatural news. And by the way, we could cool. we could use your uh, parachute stories uh, by doing that. Uh, just send it into Tim at darknessradio.com, your your emailed story. Um, oh, oh, there's one other thing today too. I did get an email. Uh, uh -huh. From some good friends of ours who normally decorate their house for Halloween, I will uh -huh. show you in the second half of our program a snapshot of what they've done with their house. It is absolutely creepy, Mally. Okay. And I'll tell you how you can vote for their house for best house on the block, and I'm encouraging all of our listeners to do so. It will creep you out. Hmm. It is unlike any other house you've ever seen. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. It is the stuff of my nightmares. Ooh. Yep. And I'm huh. encouraging everyone to do that. Um, it'll come up in our nightmare fuel segment. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, please, everybody. And and I'll put a link up in the description of this program so you can actually go and vote for them because I, I'm telling you, this this house is amazing. Uh, again, it, I, I want to see your guys' Halloween uh, decorations. If you've been decorating the house for Halloween and you've done it up, please send it in. You know what? I'll even start a blog on the darknessradioshow.com website if you want to display your... Uh, decorations for Halloween. I'll put up. I'll put up our friends as well. So I'll get the blog started that way. So I'll put up the uh, picture so you can see it. Darknessradioshow.com on uh, today's show. So there you go. All right, let's get this party started, shall we, Mal? Oh, oh, oh! I got to remind people yes. as well uh, before we get things started. Uh, Jessica Freeberg and Ghost Stories Inc. has been so kind as to start a contest. Oh, by the way, uh, one more story that we're going to talk about today. Big White Fangs, the Hainton Holler Cryptid in Kentucky. Have you ever heard of that? They're no, I haven't. Okay, we're going to talk about that today as well. Okay. Um, okay, so big giveaway for Halloween. Uh, Jessica Freeberg and Ghost Stories, Inc. is giving you a treat for trick-or-treating. Here's the deal. You can win two tickets for the November 14th through November 17th Ghost Stories, Inc. trip to the Palmer House. By the okay. way, you have to buy the hotel room. They don't, they don't furnish a hotel room, but you do get two free tickets to the event. Here's how you win those tickets. So you and a friend, okay? You have to send an email to jessica at jessicafreeberg.com with your name, your phone number, your address, and the phrase that pays, which is, I want to go ghost hunting with Jess and Tim. Okay? <laughs> easy. That's easy enough. I don't right. want your emails. If you send them to me, you're not going to win. I'm right. going to send an email back that says, eh, right across it. <laughs> and flashing red. Denied. Flashing, that's right. Denied. You're not, you're not going to get through to me. Right. Send it to Jessica. Jessica at Jessica Freeberg 
Dot.com. Now, if you're confused as to how this all works, there's a reminder in the link. Er, there's a reminder, I'm sorry, in the uh, description of this show as to how to enter. So just look in the description of this show. It'll remind you on how to enter this contest. Okay. You have one week to do so. Sunday, November 3rd at midnight is the cutoff date to win the two tickets to the event, November 14th through the 17th. It is a special event. It's a theme event, 1920s event. Really cool. So that's what we're doing. So uh, you have till Sunday, November 3rd at midnight to enter two free tickets to the ghost hunting event, Ghost Stories Inc. and Jessica Freebird up at the Palmer House Hotel. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. There's going to be not only ghost hunting, but there's going to be some cool art projects to do up there. The way that Ghost Stories Inc. does these ghost hunts, Jess, they're amazing. They're really cool. So, And I'm going to cool. be up there. Jess is going to be up there. We're going to have a good time. So you want to join us for this event? You and a friend can go for free. You do have to pay for your hotel room. But there's one hotel room left. That's the thing. You're getting in oh, on this. Oh, gotcha. You're getting in on this, and you're going to be the last people in on this. Mm-hmm. So, Jessica at JessicaFreeberg.com. Name, address, phone number, and the phrase that pays, I want to go ghost hunting with Jess and Tim. There you go. Okay, with that, we can get started. Oh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, yeah, alien news. Let's start it off with aliens. There's been a cluster of UFOs filmed near the U.S. Air Force Base in Indiana. They keep showing up now near Air Force bases. Well, that just makes me think it's something government. You think so? You think it's just a government? Yeah, if aircraft? it's just always around Air Force bases. That might be. Might be. Footage posted up on TikTok shows at least half a dozen colorful orb-shaped objects flying in formation. Now you may be right here, Mally. Mm -hmm. There was something strange in the skies near Kokomo, Indiana. Now, now I want to sing something from... I know, I know I'm going to have that song in my head this whole entire time. Let's all get it out right now. Okay. Uh, there's something strange in the skies near Kokomo, Indiana on October 7th, prompting concerns of a possible aerial incursion over the nearby Grissom Joint Air Reserve Base. Puzzled residents of the town grabbed their iPhones and cameras and started filming as several brightly lit unidentified objects appeared in the night sky. What is that? Asked one user. I think those are UFOs and I really don't feel comfortable going to sleep tonight. The mystery deepened further still when reports emerged of a huge rectangle with a clearly defined vapor shock wave that had been picked up on Doppler weather radar at around the same time. So what exactly was going on? While some believe that the phenomena was evidence of alien visitors, skeptics argue that lights in the sky were flares that had been deployed as part of some sort of military exercise. But what about the large rectangular object? Without further data, it's difficult to say for sure what it could have been. Uh, there's there's actually some... Oh, you know what? There's there's a little bit of a video right here. Al, if you can, uh -huh. Do you see that little triangular cluster in the sky? Yeah. What does it look like to you? Well, it, it's three lights, then it goes down to two, then it goes down to one, now it's two again. Yeah, I, I would just think it has something to do with the base. I think it's just something related to the base? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think if it was like zooming around and weird, sh like, I don't know. I think if it was moving around more and doing weird formations and stuff, maybe I would consider it something else, but it's just kind of like just right there. Okay. Not really moving around. Okay. We'll post it in the description of this program. You can take a look for it at the video for yourself and, and, and tell us what you think. We'll, we'll do that. I feel like I'm a funny daddy. Cause I'm like, Oh, it's the air force base. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know what? <laughs> don't, don't feel that way. It's okay to, to remain skeptical and it's okay to be skeptical about it because I, you know, when it comes to air force bases too, I tend to, to be a little skeptical myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, 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 that's, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Our next story, Mally, has to do with those cake aliens, as we call them. I, you know, I caught a little bit of um, 
A little bit of grief from a, a listener, I think it was on YouTube, who said, oh, come on, Tim, you're starting to sound like the old host when uh, when I had, had him on the uh, program. Uh-huh. Uh, we were talking about... Um, we were talking about the uh, the alien mummies in Peru. Well, I I let a, a certain guest on to talk about these aliens, and I let him, you know, I let him present his point of view. But th- that's what I did. I let him. I I let guests present their point of view, and I let you right. decide what they what they have to present. I don't ever jump on them and go, "Oh, that's a bunch of bullshit," right? Right. Um, I would never do that to a guest because, again, the the key word to guest is they're a guest on your program. Uh-huh. They're here to present their point of view, right? Well, it'd be boring if we all thought the same thing. Yeah. Right. Right. So, and I and I thought his take was very interesting. I, you know, I, I don't know what they are. I've I've never been there to poke the cake mummy and taste the frosting i don't know i have no idea what it is <laughs> right so uh mm-hmm. so it was it was interesting right it was interesting what he had to say well it turns out now there's a new story having to do with these alien mummies in peru they claim or researchers now have claimed that they made the unexpected discovery of this mystery implant while conducting an examination of the controversial remains uh Jamie or Jaime Masson's alien mummies are back in the news again this week. This time, after an alleged metallic implant of some kind was found wedged inside a mummified hand found at the excavation site. The mystery began when Masson, a controversial figure even in the UFO community, presented what he claimed to be two alien bodies at a formal Congress hearing in Mexico City back in 2023. Supposedly found buried between the Peruvian cities of Palpa and Nazca in 2017, the two bodies reportedly contained unknown DNA and were, as Masson put it, not from this earth. His claims went on to generate a great deal of controversy and debate, with experts slamming his discovery on the basis that the aliens were thought to be a little bit more than human, or to be, were thought to be little more than human mummies. Uh, Since then, several other claims have been made, ranging from the finding of additional mummies to a fingerprint analysis suggesting that these entities might not actually be human after all. Now, during a forensic dissection of a mummified hand found at the same site as the other remains, experts have discovered a strange metallic implant embedded in the palm. It is a very complex metal alloy that requires special knowledge and techniques to be able to achieve it, with such quality and purity, said Navy forensic doctor, Dr. Jose Zalsa Benitez. Uh, it was possible to identify elements such as aluminum, tin, silver, copper, cadmium, and osmium, uh, among others, in smaller quantities and percentages. So could this piece of strange metal be a genuine implant, or was it placed inside the hand after death, perhaps as part of some sort of ritualistic practice and in any case does this really add credence to the idea that these remains are extraterrestrial the search for answers it says continues Hmm. so here's a picture of the hand Melly, and where exactly they pulled that implant from okay it looks a little creepy yeah i i don't know i mean why? My question is, why would you implant a piece of metal after death? Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I can understand, I, I guess, I can understand why you would put one in before death. There's different reasons to put one in before death. But after death, there's really not a reason to implant metal. Wouldn't you think? No. I, I can't think of a reason. Mm-mm. Me neither. Yeah. Interesting story, though. All right, we move on. The Netherlands is now encouraging pilots to report UFO encounters. The Dutch Safety Board has signaled that it will be accepting reports of UAPs by aviation professionals. Given the increasing amount of attention the UFO phenomenon has been receiving in the U.S. in recent years, it's perhaps no surprise that authorities in countries outside the United States would also begin to take the topic more seriously as well, especially in regards to any risks that such subjects might pose to aircraft within their airspace. Earlier this month, as as an example, the Dutch Safety Board made a move to suggest that 
It would now be accepting reports for unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, by aviation professionals. The board, which runs independently of the Dutch government, is responsible for investigating any serious accidents that occur in the Netherlands, whether that be on the ground or in the air. As such, reports of encounters with unknown aerial vehicles is of legitimate concern. The news that the board would be taking the subject more seriously came from its correspondence with UFO group UAP Coalition Coalition Netherlands. The quote here is, as a coalition, we are pleased to report that OVV, the Dutch Safety Board, has indicated that it wants to receive reports of UAP from Dutch aviation professionals, the coalition wrote. Airspace can be endangered by experiences with UAP, so it's positive that an independent administrative body wants to gain more insight into this and take reports seriously. We see this as recognition and an important step towards achieving our goal. Well, interesting, that's for sure, mm-hmm. that the Netherlands wants to keep up on that sort of thing. Meanwhile, well, if it's a cover oh, for like national security, like they're not really looking for UFOs, they're looking for people to report like spies. That's a good idea. You know what, you know what I mean? Cover. Yeah. It's yeah. a cover. The UFO thing is a cover. Yeah. No, I, I, you're right. You're right. I, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put it past them. There, there's many different reasons why you would announce a program like that and not have it be truly a program for UAP. Mm-hmm. Um, or it's a, it's a secondary air defense uh, having to do with defending borders, right? Mm-hmm. Right. If you want to remain a neutral country and you're worried about an invasion, whether it be from the East or the West, whether you're mm-hmm. worried about well, let's face it, whether you're worried about Russia moving in further mm-hmm. into Europe um, and you have some concerns, but you don't want to put it out there, right? Like you're, you you don't want to sound the alarm too quickly and say, well, right. we're worried that Russia is moving further and further in, you know, and mm-hmm. we want to make sure that we're safe. So we're going to establish a heavy border. Mm-hmm. Um you know, you don't want to tip off the Russians that you're you're arming, especially if you're a somewhat neutral country. Mm-hmm. So that's a good way of doing it. You're right, Mel. Yeah, yeah. It's a good way of doing it. Yeah. Good call. Good call. <laughs> um, that's something I Thank didn't you. think of. Yeah, something I didn't think of. Um, our next story has to do with astronomers scouring something called TRAPPIST-1 and that system for alien signals. The latest search for evidence of alien life is focused on looking for alien worlds that are sending messages to one another. If an advanced extraterrestrial civilization has spread to multiple planets, it stands to reason that they must be able to send signals back and forth between worlds. If the Earth happens to be in the firing line, therefore, it should be possible for us to pick up those communications. That is, at least... According to astronomers from Penn State in the SETI Institute, who recently spent 28 hours scanning the TRAPPIST-1 star system for evidence of extraterrestrial signals. TRAPPIST-1 is of particular interest to astronomers because it is thought to be home to seven terrestrial worlds, several of which being located in this star's habitable zone where the temperature is sufficient for liquid water to exist on a planet's surface. Ultimately, though, despite a record-breaking attempt to detect signals using the Allen Telescope Array, or ATA, the teams were unable to pick up any of these signs of extraterrestrial activity. Their efforts certainly didn't go to waste, however. This research shows that we are getting closer to technology and methods that could detect radio signals similar to the ones that we send into space, said Penn State graduate student Nick Toussaint. Uh, Most searches assume a powerful signal, like a beacon intended to reach distant planets because our receivers have a sensitivity limit uh, due to a minimum transmitter power beyond anything we intentionally send out. But with better equipment like the upcoming Square Kilometer Array, we might soon be able to detect signals from an alien civilization communicating with its spacecraft. 
So they basically got like a 250 watt transmitter sitting in the bottom of the uh, student radio station that they're using. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Essentially, is what it sounds like. They got like the old 250 watt uh, transmitter from back in the 1970s. They're using. Yeah. That's what I. That's what I come away with. It. Mm-hmm. Lack of funding. Lack of funds, uh, <laughs> as our good friend uh, Dave LaGreca would say. They got the old uh, Italian disease, lack of funds. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> you never heard that? No? Uh-uh. It's one of the... Uh, lack of funza. Lack of funza. It's one of my favorite bits that uh, Dave, Dave LaGreca does. Lack of funza. Do colleges even still have radio stations? Most of them do. A lot of them are automated, though, which is really disappointing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know... The the one that I used to work with, work in, in at college at, at Winona State, they do have some live DJs, but they're automated a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Which is, what's the point of having a student right, exactly. radio station, right? When you're automated, but mm-hmm. uh, I suppose because it's there, it's it's there if any student wants to take advantage of it and go on and and do live broadcasting. But mm-hmm. um, the other thing that that student radio stations have done now is they simulcast on, on the internet so that you can, right. You know, you can be heard outside of your, your borders of your town, Mm -hmm. which is great for exposure. You know, it, it gives a little bit more of an audience to students who are trying to learn and, and gets them feedback from outside of a a limited area. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's, that's great. Um, but yeah, that yeah, the, there are student radio stations. They are out there. It's just that they operate at such low power, um, mm-hmm. you know. I and I don't know really what the audience is for them mm-hmm. in this day and time, right? You know, in smaller towns, they do get an audience, mm-hmm. um, but in larger towns, they're almost non-existent. Well, back in our day, we didn't have Sirius XM or any of those. So you had just your AM and FM. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I remember coming across a college. I don't for, I forget which college it was, though, but you, it was college radio. And I liked it because it was kind of like new wave music that they played. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's the great thing about student radios, uh, student run radio stations, too, is they mm-hmm. expor- experiment with formats. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, it may not be technically the best radio out there, but. You know, they do, they do take chances, which, which, Mm -hmm. you know, commercial radio doesn't do. Right. So that's what makes it exciting. It's thrill, it's thrilling radio because it, Mm -hmm. you know, it's out there on the edge. So, yeah, it's, it's worth giving a listen to and and it's worth, um, although they don't, a lot of stations don't take direct donations, um, Mm -hmm. They do operate off what's called an Ampers grant, which is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a direct form of funding. And so to, you know, support them in any way you can, in any way they need when, when they, it comes fundraising time. Um, yeah, just get behind them because it, uh, it's tough. It's tough for them to, to survive on the budgets mm-hmm. they have to survive on. Right. Yeah. It's pretty rare to come across them these days, but, but yeah, student run radio. I'm all, I'm all about it. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's for sure. Is that how you got your ladies back in the day? <laughs> well, you know, uh, you're the man on campus. The, the size of my microphone was important at that time. Let's just say. Yeah. <sighs> and I learned a valuable lesson. Never. Uh, <laughs> big grin on your face yeah. right now <laughs> uh, <the> valuable, <laughs> flashbacks <laughs> valuable lesson i learned is never date on the other side of that telephone That's, yeah. <laughs> you never know who's on the other side of that telephone yeah. you never say hey let's meet in person <laughs> yeah that's a big mistake <laughs> their voice was deceiving <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes indeed oh my gosh Yep, you learn you learn <laughs> lessons quick, Mally, in this business. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you thought internet dating was scary? Try radio dating. That's boy, oh boy. That'll just stop. close your eyes and have her talk. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> yeah, that much more satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> How do we get on this? Um oh, I was gonna mention Dave LaGreca. Uh Dave LaGreca, for those of you who are wrestling fans, uh was was on the uh WWE NXT pay per view on Sunday night, Halloween Havoc. Hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to say congratulations to our buddy Dave LaGreca for for Very uh, cool. Yeah. So speaking of Sirius XM, he's the uh He's the founder and host of Busted Open, uh, Busted Open Radio. So, um, but yeah, he was he was uh, he was hosting along with uh, Bubba Ray Dudley um, the the Halloween Havoc pay per view. So, I thought Very that cool. was that was awesome. So, I mm -hmm. just to, just to see Dave uh, doing his thing. So, uh, he's you know, by leaps and bounds, he's been forming a relationship with WWE. And I think that's, uh, that's really, really cool. I can, uh, I can say I knew Dave when. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was cool to be sitting there watching Halloween Havoc and seeing uh, Dave LaGreca on, uh, on Busted Open or uh, not on uh. Busted Open, on, on Halloween Havoc. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, so we'll, we'll jump back into stories. Here. Um, okay. Our next story has to do with uh, scientists discovering potential hiding places for life, alien life on Mars. Not just in the universe, but on Mars itself. Mm -hmm. The study identifies key locations where extraterrestrial life might be most likely to thrive. Uh, scientists suggest that Mars's mid-latitudes beneath layers of dust-filled ice may harbor the right conditions for photosynthesis process by which plants, algae, and cyanobacteria on Earth convert light and water into energy producing oxygen. The researchers whose findings were published in Nature Communications, Earth and Environment, believe that these essential components for life also could be present beneath Mars's icy surface. And now my iPad won't move. <laughs> I think that's enough of that story. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now, now that I say that's enough, it wants to move. Mm -hmm. Both Earth and Mars lie within the sun's habitable zone, a region where temperatures allow liquid water to exist on planetary surfaces. While Earth is covered in 71% liquid water, Mars is a dry, barren landscape. However, evidence from rovers and orbiters suggests that Mars once had liquid water billions of years ago. Today, water on Mars exists primarily as ice, not just at the poles, but also in mid-latitude regions. Mars likely lost its liquid water when its magnetic field weakened, causing most of its atmosphere to escape and exposing the planet to harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Despite this, scientists propose that photosynthesis could still occur between or rather beneath the protective ice layers in the mid-latitudes. Um, well, interesting. So there's mm -hmm. potential for alien life there on Mars. There you go. All right. That is where we take our break right there. When we come back, Mally. Uh-huh. Got a little nightmare fuel for you. Okay, doke. We almost always do. Gotta, I know. I don't think we've that. ever gone without. No, nope, <laughs> haven't gone without. Uh, also, when we come back, an interesting story about a member of the Stranger Things cast who's had a paranormal encounter on a movie set. We'll talk about that. Hmm. We're going to ask the question, why do ghosts wear clothes or sheets instead of appearing in the nude? Just one of those. Like we say in sheets. <laughs> I know, right? That, that, well, that's the that's the headline in the in the story. <clears throat> I bet you there are some that appear nude. You think? We just haven't been lucky to see them. Yeah, I think if someone died naked, like while having sex or something, maybe they would come back naked. Porn star ghosts. Well, that lady from The Shining was naked in the bathtub. Oh, yeah, but she was that a creepy lady. She was a demon, though, wasn't she? I guess, yeah. Yeah. But still, she was naked. She was a trickster. Yep. Yep. A psychic looking for a man's missing daughter finds human remains. We'll talk about that story when we come back. A uh, An interesting story in that 
There's a couple of Bigfoot stories today. A political candidate wants to make Bigfoot the state animal of Idaho. And a story sent in by a listener, Bigfoot was spotted in, a, in an Oklahoma wildfoot refuge in a 10-second TikTok video with someone calling it the scariest moment in my life. Hmm. We'll get to that. That line of Bigfoot, big white fangs, the haint and holler cryptid <laughs> in Kentucky. It might be a cryptid that Mally's never heard of. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that as well. And what exactly that cryptid is. It's an interesting one, I'll tell you that. Okay. I actually have to know what part of Kentucky. I'll actually I actually peeked into that article. Ah. And we end today's show by telling you why bears are not going to be your favorite Halloween guest <laughs> this Halloween. I, I tend to think some bears are kind of cute. This night, maybe they show up and just drink punch and leave. You never know, Mel. Mm. Could happen. <laughs> All right, that's uh, that's what's up in the second half of Supernatural News. Again, we could use your pair of share stories. You can send them in one of three ways. Tim at DarknessRadio.com if you type them out the old-fashioned way. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you... If you care to do so, you can go to darknessradioshow.com. You have two minutes to leave a voice note. If you click that blue button that's on the right-hand side of the website, just click it. You've got two minutes to leave your voice note. If you need more time, click that blue button again. Leave another two minutes for your story. I'll stitch everything together, and I'll play it here on the show. The third way is if you have a studio just like the one you see right here behind me. I mean, not my studio. Don't come into my house and start recording. I'll, I'll hit you with my baseball bat. I'm just saying. You'll scare me in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you have a studio similar to this one, you can sit down, you can lay down some tracks, your voice tracks, maybe some music, some sound effects, put together your own theater of the mind, send it in right here to Darkness Radio. I'll review it. And uh, by gosh, if it passes the muster, I'll put it on right here on this show. You will air your theater of the mind right here on Darkness Radio. Tell you what, when we come back, We've got plenty of your stories, and we have an impressive haunted house to show you. And you can I'm vote for it. That. Yeah, and you can vote for it, Mally. So mm -hmm. it will win a prize. We'll tell you how you can do that when we come back right here on The Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Along with me is Mally Fox. It is a supernatural news Wednesday. And Mally, mm -hmm. it's been unseasonably warm this Halloween. Yes, it has. I'm telling you, it's been great weather. Unfortunately, we might dip a little bit here in the Twin Cities. You're probably going to have a warm Halloween there in Michigan, I'm guessing, right? We're supposed to have a little rain during the day, but then it's supposed to be fine. So in, in my town, they don't have school the next day on Friday. So that might help with the trick-or-treaters. Seriously? Yeah. I don't know if they're doing that here or not. I saw a weird thing today uh, sitting out on the porch. There were kids out hitting a volleyball until like nine in the morning. So I don't know what they're doing this week with school. Oh, huh, that's weird. Yeah, I don't know. But I think they jumped on a bus at nine. But they were older okay. kids. Okay. Are they changing, like, school hours or something? I didn't think so. I don't know. It was very weird. It was weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting to the age now where I don't know what they're doing with school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, shouldn't your kids be in school or have a job? <laughs> I'll sick my chipmunk after you. Yeah, <laughs> you're one of those crotchety people on yeah. facebook yeah, that's yeah. like complaining about stuff that garbage people left my can out in the middle of the street yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, there's they, my tax dollars <laughs> they, 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 yeah my tax dollars even though i pay them independently <laughs> they came by today too I, I i'm the old guy who waves at them i'm like hi <laughs> hi mr garbage man 
Oi. <laughs> the little the little girls next door they do that to the garbage the male lady we have a very yeah. nice male yeah. person she has all the gossip in town so we'll sit there and talk to her for like 10 minutes <laughs> she brings dog treats for my dogs and everything she just she yeah she has the lowdown she helps people sell their houses because she'll tell people oh yeah on this street they're, they <laughs> put their house up for sale so if you know anybody <laughs> <laughs> I I keep a box awesome. of milk bones too though. So yeah. Because uh -huh. we have a lot of we have a lot of dogs in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. yeah. We got Bo who's just kitty corner from us. We got and then uh -huh. we got another uh big dog. I don't remember what the big dog is, who's right across the street from us. But yeah, we got we have mm -hmm. a lot of big dogs out. So yeah. But but Bo I think is our favorite. He's a he's a big German shepherd. So yeah. So, <laughs> so we have little dog treats. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's very sweet of you. Yeah. So when they come by, if they, if they're nice, nice doggies, we give them a milk bone. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guilty of that. Is that an old man thing to give, give up milk bones? No, old man things to talk about is trip chipmunks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm guilty of that too. Yeah. I'm just teasing. See, that's, it's, it all just makes me so happy, Mel. And I'm just, I know just, they I, do. They make I you very know. happy. <clears throat> now, if you start knitting clothes for them though, <laughs> and next year I see oh, your Christmas no. card, and they're wearing sweaters. <laughs> no. Although I, I am guilty of looking in the, is it the Hemmer Schlepper or whatever catalog? <laughs> Oh, yep. Yeah. I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, for toys and toys and uh, clothes for him. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yeah. That's, is that going too far? No. Yeah. Hey, I follow videos that raccoons are wearing clothes <laughs> and they've become domesticated. <laughs> and this one guy has a meerkat. I think they're oh, called meerkats. Yeah. And so like it'll stand on his shoulder while he drives and they wear like glasses and a headscarf and stuff. Yeah. And they do it to this song. But yeah. That one is spoiled. I I seriously, because Spud is getting on, she's getting a little mm -hmm. older. I I started thinking about maybe I should bring her in the house mm -hmm. for the winter, and I thought mm, I could see problems. <laughs> yeah, because with my luck, you know, they don't fully sleep during the winter. They mm -hmm. go into what's called torpor, so they wake up. They they wake up. They eat. They go back to sleep. You know, they mm -hmm. wake up. They go to the bathroom. They go to sleep. It's kind of like us in the winter, but you know, except for they don't have jobs. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, you know, but, right. but they, you know, they just go into like an extended sleep, but mm -hmm. I can see her waking up and then just start chirping her head off. Cause she does that a lot. She did it today. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like wake up and forget that she came inside. Right. She just, mm -hmm. cheep, 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 you know, cause I do have, did I, did I tell you I have a bed for her? No, you did not. I didn't. Mm -mm. Should I show you the picture of the. The sure. bunk beds. I, I I did I did buy her a bunk bed. I didn't oh, tell a you. bunk bed. Yeah, I, I bought <laughs> I bought bunk beds for him because she looked like she was getting tired out there on the lawn. Mm -hmm. Like she'll sit out there on the lawn all day, and she was getting to the point where she was looking like she was like a like her head was getting a little droopy, mm -hmm. right? So it was kind of like, oh, you know, her head's getting a little. Droopy. Is it from like the Barbie collection, or do they make specific beds for animals? No, if you go to Target, they make they make those eighteen inch dolls that look like American Girl dolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's part of their collection. Uh, okay, so it is from Target. <laughs> and and the mattress was so soft, Mel. I mean, it was like a little soft. Yeah, uh -huh. you know. You know Just like, tell people that you're buying it for your knees. <laughs> maybe I did. Um, you know, I just said I was a really good uncle. I didn't tell him I'm buying it for my chipmunk. Um, yeah. you know, cause I, 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 I didn't want them to report me to the police, but I, I showed here, I showed Jess, but look at this. I mean, look at, I mean, every, it's every little chipmunk stream, right? I mean, Oh, that's cute. See, Yeah. That is cute. See, I mean, look at that. That's yeah. That's cute. Yeah. See, and I built it myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's got little butterfly uh it's got little butterfly foot pillows and it's got little uh -huh. head pillows for him to rest and it's got a little blankie that they can... Isn't you just keep it in the garage or where do you keep it well i bring it out each day for him oh okay yeah gotcha. so it's, it's out on the porch so does if, she does she actually sit in it or lay in it if i put a peanut in there they will ah gotcha yeah so they'll go eat a peanut in there and then they kind of sit in it and they're like what is this thing we're sitting in and they get out of it. 
Gotcha. So they, they haven't quite realized it's a blanket. I tried to, because there are, there are videos on YouTube where, mm-hmm. where you'll see a, a little, a little chipmunk laying in a bed and actually taking a nap on oh. a pillow. And I'm trying to <clears throat> train them to, to sleep in the bed. Okay. Because I have no fucking life. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's going to be my next deal. <laughs> That and learn and and teach yourself guitar <laughs> and teach myself guitar. Well, I know I know a little guitar. I know I know how play, to play play the guitar while the chipmunks you know yes I'm going sleep. To, I'm going to sing them a song yes lullabies yeah, yeah I'd be like renegade you had a maid now go to fucking sleep <laughs> right uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, what was I saying oh such a happy scenario anyways. Hey, if it makes you happy and it brightens up your day, I'm all for it. Yeah, right. Not done, not according to AI. <laughs> Evidently, bunk beds are too happy for them. <laughs> little, little chipmunk bunk beds. I think it's time to go see a psychiatrist. What do you think? Is it, is it time? <laughs> hey, I've got a dollhouse if you want it. <laughs> That's actually what their nut hut is made of. We have a little uh-huh. nut hut for them where, uh-huh. that keeps them protected from birds. And it's made out of gotcha. a giant. It's, it used to be a horse barn. It used to be. A, okay. Yeah. And they've, it's got a second deck that they absolutely love that they go up mm-hmm. on and they eat peanuts out of it. So. <laughs> I should take a picture of that for you and show it to you next time. So. <laughs> it's called Chip Chip's Nut Hut. Everybody right now is rolling their eyes. They're like, just get to the story. (laughs) Newsman, get to the story. Researchers say they are close to successfully crafting synthetic life forms, Mally. Synthetic life forms. Just wrong. It's so wrong. Pretty soon I'll have a synthetic chipmunk I can keep in the house. (laughs) Although Dr. Frankenstein created new forms of life and grisly experiments that relied on combining spare parts, Dutch researchers, they love gold, (laughs) (laughs) say they are now attempting to build synthetic life forms from the ground up and potentially more efficiently than nature. As life evolved on Earth, each step forward was built on the last, leading to increasingly complex but sometimes inefficient systems. Now, I believe it is... Basic, B-A-S-Y-C, building a synthetic cell is a consortium of six research institutes working on perfecting the natural processes that give rise to life. In a pair of new papers, their research represents significant new steps and advancement towards that goal. Since 2017, Basic has been working on creating a synthetic cell, the basic building block of life. A gravity grant from the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture, and Science, along with the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, or the NWO, (laughs) too sweet, (laughs) provided 18.8, I think this is million pounds in funding, to begin operations. Progress has been steady with an estimated two to three years left in the program. The end game of the program is to construct synthetic lifelike systems that can grow autonomously, divide, and sustain themselves. It will differ from known living cells but have these essential features. University of Groningen professor of biochemistry and team leader Dr. Bert Pullman told the debrief in an email. Now... Within living cells, mitochondria generate the energy that they require to function, and in nature, hundreds of different elements make up that cellular powerhouse. The basic team is now streamlining nature's design, reducing it to just five elements across a two-part artificial system. The advantage in is noted, or rather is rooted, in knowing where the system design is headed allowing the researchers to develop fine-tuned solutions at the most basic level, unlike evolution, which only builds on what came before, unable to turn back the clock and reconsider earlier choices. Existing mitochondria work through a cycle of converting the molecule ADP to ATP, then back, releasing the energy cells run on. This system is housed in 
tiny cell-like sacs known as vesicles. The first vesicle in the loop absorbs ADP and amino acid arginine through the sac walls before burning the arginine to produce ATP. Spending the cell is an entirely different problem. During this process, another vesicle absorbs the ATP and reverts it back to ADP, releasing the energy needed to power work, like the growth in cell division. The process completes when the second vesicle sends the ADP back into the first, resuming the cycle. The downside is reducing the many elements of mitochondria to five is that the system you or the system can only run on arginine and not the fats, sugars, or even other amino acids that can power animal cells. Well, that could be a small problem. Uh, mm-hmm. Pullman's other creation is a vesicle for creating a negative electrical charge, like an electric circuit. It uses a chemical process where positively charged proteins enter the vesicle, pushing other molecules like lactose towards the negative center. This process mimics the behavior of living cells. Additionally, further testing showed the vesicle capable of more complex feats, adding enzymes in addition to lactose. The system oxidized the lactose sugar and created the coenzyme NADH. Dr. Poole explained some of the challenges his team faced during development. The greatest obstacles are generally integrating Nod- or I'm sorry, modules, not nodules, but modules, and creating out of equilibrium conditions. Thus, the optimal conditions are not necessarily the same for different modules. In biology, this is solved by evolution, and here we engineer minimal systems that work best for multiple modules. So, you may uh, ask yourself, where does this all go? Well, Pullman and Basic have made significant progress, more must be done before total synthetic cells are reality. After the basic program concludes in the next few years, its replacement is already lined up. NWO has extended another 40 million pounds research grant to the follow-up program Evolve. Evolving life from non-life is what it stands for. And plenty of work remains to be completed in this innovative field of research quote here is we are still more than 10 years away from such a synthetic lifelike system dr pullman went on to say meanwhile we learn a lot of biological mechanisms and discover surprising properties that emerge when bringing biological components together 10 years mally away Mm -hmm. from a biological construct I just don't like this stuff. <laughs> I just don't see. Uh, I see being positive. I see what everything goes wrong. I'm on the negative side of it. I think it's intriguing the way the, the way that it, it doesn't necessarily run uh, the way we, we run. I mean, the, the cells mm-hmm. itself aren't fueled the way that we're fueled. So is that necessarily a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, mm. You know, we'll, I guess we'll find out, right? Yeah, 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. Uh, and and do we, you know, much like Frankenstein, do we take after this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is it is it Pitchfork and Torch City, right, when this thing comes out? Right. Or do we, you know, do we... Embrace it? Yeah, right? I. I I don't know. I just, I think I watch too many movies where something like this gets in the wrong hands and then just goes nuts, like a muck, just, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, oh, man, it, it's, it's, um, there's times I have a hard time wrapping my head around it because the science is so, is so complex, but at the same time, mm-hmm. I think to myself, you know, we've come through, such advances so quickly that, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to understand half of it to see it work. Right. You know, after a while it just becomes second nature and you go, Oh Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's just an artificial construct, you know, and we use it as, as easily as we use a kitchen utensil Mm -hmm. and then we find ways to put it to work. And I worry that 
we put these things into use in daily life so quickly. Look at mm-hmm. um, driverless cars and how quickly we yeah. put them out on the road. That, I mean, just that alone and, and without too many safety precautions, right? Mm-hmm. And it just ends up sometimes in, in more injuries and more death. It's, it's scary mm-hmm. stuff, I tell you. Speaking of death, Mally. <coughs> there's a new death clock out there, an AI longevity app that claims that it can predict when you'll die. Oh, there's a movie like that. I forget what it's called, though, but they had like a death clock. Yes. Yeah. A new AI longevity app called the Death Clock predicts that the Grim Reaper will appear on well, the person who wrote this article on their doorstep on January 30th, 2077, shortly after their 92nd birthday. Well, this Oh, person, if I had that date, I'd be fine. Right. Oh yeah. I would yeah. <laughs> be like 92. I'm good. Yeah, I'd I'd be living it up right now. I'd have Yeah, exactly. Drinking one hand a cigar and the other in a joint between my lips. <laughs> if I had tomorrow, oh I'd be a basket case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The author says with the average life expectancy for women between being 80.2 years, I'm not doing so badly. Oh, no, <laughs> they're not. The rest of us are sweating, though. Founded by serial entrepreneur Brent Franson, Death Clock aims to extend and enhance users' quality of life by providing deep insights to how their lifestyle influence and influences their life expectancy trained on 1,217 studies with over 53 million participants as data sets the app uses AI technology to create predictions on an individual's approximate date of death along with overall life expectancy biological aid, age rather, and health scores compared to their peers the app also offers projections on how long people might live after incorporating lifestyle changes. In a statement following the app's release, Dr. Sanjeev Gol, founder of Peak Human and one of Canada's top longevity doctors, said longevity is primarily influenced by factors of a healthy lifestyle, such as diet, exercise, stress levels, and sleep. Longevity is usually further defined by lifespan versus health span. Individuals need to be proactive, such as the interventions to increase longevity require many years of proactive lifestyle choices, Goal add, added. Uh, lifestyle at this moment is the only proven method to influence longevity. Longevity is a complex process and requires an intervention that would have an effect in multiple processes in the body. When users sign in to Death Clock, the app asks them a series of questions. It then creates a custom longevity program or plan recommending behavior changes, dietary supplements, screenings, and pertinent discussions with their healthcare provider. The platform enables users to securely upload personal health documents such as blood tests and genetic profiles, ensuring a personalized AI health companion for each individual. In today's world, healthcare is typically reactive, intervening only when problems arrive and often too late, said Brent Franson, founder of Death Clock. In a statement, Death Clock represents the shift to Medicine 3.0, where individuals are equipped with comprehensive knowledge about their health and encouraged to proactively manage their wellness to enjoy longer, healthier lives. By the way, Death Clock or The Death Clock can be downloaded from the Apple App Store and Google Play Stores for a small annual fee of $39.99. No, I don't need to pay for how long I'm going to live. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is, what is the um, shelf life of like nacho cheese? Because that's basically what my whole body's made of right now. So I've been eating <laughs> a lot of nachos. So if nacho cheese can survive like the atomic bomb, I will live forever. I. Do you throw any Nutella in with that? I have not had Nutella for a while. Speaking of, did I tell you I have a recipe to send to you? No. Oh, I've got three words for Is you. Is it now. Nutella? Nutella pound cake. Mm-hmm. It may change your life. That sounds good. Why have you had it? 
I've seen. Did you the, try it out? I've seen the recipe. I oh, just, okay. I, I think I need to send it to you to make just to tell me whether it's good or not. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm not allowed to tell us. That's why I haven't had it for a while. You're you're not on so. it. No, I'm out of it. Oh, oh. So I usually have like three or four jars in my cupboard, but okay. Uh, yeah. No, I haven't stocked up, and I went through the last of it because my kids like Nutella. I'm gonna have to get some to oh. you. I know. Yeah. Because I made I made Nutella like a French toast thing <gasps> for all my neighbors, and then I used up the last Nutella, and then I haven't done anything since. Oh. It's like a Nutella casserole. So freaking good. Nutella casserole? Yeah. It's like a French toast like with Nutella and powdered sugar and stuff. Yeah. It's delicious. So I make it every once in a while and I made some for the neighbors because I have an old lady next to me. And so oh I make God. her some. Nutella casserole. I would have died, mm -hmm. died yeah. to heaven. Yeah. It's just like French toast. I think I talked about it before, but you do, you like soak, you soak your, your bread in like the egg mixture, the egg and cinnamon. Yeah. And then, but before you do that, you, you spread Nutella on the bread and then you roll it up and then you dip it in the egg mixture and then you fill up your casserole dish and then you bake it and then you sprinkle powdered sugar. So it's like a, yeah, it's, I think it's called Nutella French to toast casserole or something, but I make it every once in a while. The kids really like it. Oh, and then you put whipped cream on it. You don't, so it's almost like a dessert. You don't ice the the dessert with the leftover Nutella, do you? And then put the oh yeah, you on? you kind of do that like what do you call it? You, you, uh, you drizzle it. Not streusel. Yeah, you drizzle. <gasps> so like at the you take your fork and just go. Oh. So yeah. Oh. It's so good. But my dad doesn't like it because he doesn't like egg stuff. What? So it throws him off. Yeah, he doesn't eat French toast. He doesn't eat eggs. He does so any. Any kind of casserole, egg casserole, he doesn't do. So he doesn't like it. I'm like, this is like the best freaking thing ever. Seriously? Yeah. He's set in his ways. He's the only child. I guess, right? <laughs> Mr. Fox, you need to get on this. This I know. He hates it when I tell him. <laughs> this sounds it's like... It's your only child syndrome. I tell you what. You could drop this in the middle of hungry countries and you could save the hunger problem forever. Exactly. Yeah. Saving people one jar at a time. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's That's my slogan. Right. I love it. One jar at a time. That's right. You just drop a Nutella casserole in the middle of a country. You make the <laughs> large, world's largest Nutella casserole, according to Guinness Book of World Records. You could feed an entire country. You'd be done. There we go. Yeah. Keep the farmers busy with all my eggs I need. That's Except right. Except for the price of eggs nowadays. Yeah. Jeez Louise. Yeah, it's, it's still high. Pigs and butter. Good God. Yeah. Now I need dessert. <laughs> oh, you know what would be awesome? If you mm -hmm. ever, you ever listen to us, we're talking about food now. It's like, I know we always we screw always this paranormal track, thing. Talk about food. That's right. <laughs> hey, now you've seen the angel food flips in the, in the bakery section, right? And have you ever angel seen angel food flips? Yeah, have you ever seen an angel food flip, like a banana flip? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's mm -hmm. generally they've got like buttercream frosting in the middle. Yep. Okay. Mm hmm. Put Nutella in the middle of that. Mm. Oh, angel food flip with Nutella in the middle. Mm -hmm. That would be good. You. Oh, my God. I have saved so many Nutella recipes. I just have to start doing them again. I've just been so... Oh, life gets in the way, you know. I know. With kids and stuff. But like you said, fall is... Well, fall is here. But winter's fall coming where I don't have all these outdoor activities. And the kids are kind of quieting down with their stuff for a little bit. Yeah. So maybe I'll start baking again. Plus, they make locks on closets. You just throw them in the closet and <laughs> and you do what you need to do. You know? My kids need to stop being athletic and social. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just a taxi driver <laughs> lately. <laughs> what you do is you drop them off at one of those um, malls. Is that what they call it? Mm -hmm. And then you just let yeah. them get lost. And then you go do what you need to do, right? That's why Do I'm, people even go to the malls anymore? No, I think they're. I all, miss those days. I think they're all abandoned. Yeah. Have you? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But have you seen those videos that you'll see on social media, and they're like the malls in 1989 or 1993, and it's like yeah. packed. People are like smoking in there and stuff, and <laughs> yes. you've just got everyone. It was like it was like the hangout. Like the food court was gigantic. Actually, yeah. The I know we're way off topic, but they're. I was talking to my uncle the other day and 
South Dale Mall, and and he dined. Yeah, is now one of the leading mm-hmm. malls in I the country. I haven't been there for a while. Oh, it's it's one of the leading malls in the country because they've changed the model of what they do. Nice. Yeah, and it's now one of the the highest money making malls in the in the country. And that's good. They've they've actually changed the way they cater to the retail shopper. Okay, what are what have they done differently? I haven't been to Minnesota or to a mall in Minnesota for a while because usually when I come to Minnesota, I'm not heading towards the mall. But they've I'm trying to remember what it is they've done, but they've changed it in subtle ways. Okay. Yeah, it's more service based. The the shops are a little more non traditional. Mm Hmm. But they've they've got it so it appeals more to the average retail shopper. That was smart. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So I I'm impressed. And, and and I'm trying to remember it, it's it's owned by it's owned by a retail group from out of state, so it's, yeah, it's not locally owned anymore. Okay. Same with Mall of America. I mean, those developers are. I, it used to be there's a Canadian developer that owned um, Mall of America. I'm not sure, uh-huh. if it, but right. Mall, Mall of America is having a problem with maintaining um, cli- or clients or or. Um, uh, these leasers or leases right now. Is it because they charge too much? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the rent is incredibly high right now. Oh. In fact, they've they've sued two renters in the last six months mm. because of high rent and and those those people wanting to get out of their lease. It's an interesting right. interesting story. So yeah. Hmm. Okay, we'll we'll move on here. Uh, um, Sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, the death clock, uh, thirty nine ninety nine, small annual fee. It says here users can start their health assessment for free with te- temporary access to the full suite with features available in a seven day free trial. Um, essentially, that's that's it for the death clock. Uh, you say for thirty nine ninety nine, it's not worth it for you for an annual fee. Not for annual. I don't. I don't need to remind myself each year how, <laughs> how well, when or when I'm gonna die. <laughs> I think the idea is it has more features to keep you updated mm-hmm. throughout the year as to things you need to change. Oh well, I already know I need to change, <laughs> but just because someone's telling me to doesn't mean I'm really going to. Eh. You know what I saw today? I saw that Apple Watches now give you sleep apnea alerts. Oh. Yeah. I know my watch tells me like the quality of sleep I'm having, but for sleep apnea, that's interesting. Yeah. I thought that was completely interesting. Mm -hmm. The Apple watch is giving you sleep apnea alerts and the, I know the AirPods now are giving you, um, they're, they're doubling the new AirPods are doubling as, Mm -hmm. uh, over the counter, um, hearing aids. Oh, yeah, they're low grade. They're low grade hearing okay, aids, but they right. double as a low grade hearing aid. Mm. So not only will it help define music for you as you listen to it, and define voice mm-hmm. as you listen to it from your phone, but it has a double use as a hearing aid, over the counter hearing aid. What if you're sneaky and you you put them in so you can hear other people's conversations, like at the next table over, and they just think you're listening to music? That's pretty sneaky. Mm-hmm. See if they're talking about you. I don't think it works that well. I, ah. I don't think that. I don't think they're like <laughs> I Spy type AirPods where you can hear four buildings over. Although that would be really cool for as much as they cost. They should. Right. They really should do that. They just think you're listening to music. Meanwhile, they're talking about like mm, she shouldn't be wearing those leggings. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> as I'm getting my coffee. What? <laughs> what? How dare you talk about me like that? Mm-hmm. You're like, damn, she has superpower hearing. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you taste food really well, too? <laughs> You're a superhuman. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of superhuman, uh, do you watch Stranger Things? I do. Oh, turns out that one of the stars of Stranger Things had a paranormal encounter on the movie set. Uh, on a movie set, I should say. On mm-hmm. a, I'll clarify that. Uh, the actor who plays one of the show's main characters encountered a potential real-life ghost in an old mansion. Ooh. Yeah. Finn Wolford. Wolfhard. Wolford? Wolfhard? Mm-hmm. I, I don't watch it. I don't know how to say his last name, but I know who you're talking about. Yes. Who played the role of Mike Wheeler 
in Netflix's hit Stranger Things since 2016 is certainly no stranger uh, to acting in movies with supernatural elements. Not only did he play a major role in the two latest Ghostbusters movies, I know who he is now, mm -hmm. uh, but he also starred in as uh, one of the main characters in the recent two-part adaptation of Stephen King's It. Uh, it was during filming of the latter that the 21-year-old would have his own real-life paranormal encounter. He said, there was a time when I was a kid shooting It. Isn't that cute? I mean, he, it wasn't that <laughs> long ago. Uh, in this abandoned mansion in Toronto, and me and a bunch of the other cast were exploring the floors, he told People Magazine during a recent interview. We went up to the top floor, and there was one room where there was a guy in black, and we saw him just kind of doing electrician work. And we were like, okay, that's just a crew member. But then later we found out there was no one who was, we found that no one knew who was, who that was. It's an odd okay, sentence. Let me try this again. He said, but <laughs> then later we found out that no one knew who that was and no one ever saw him again. It could have been someone just messing around, but yeah, it was pretty scary, he went on to say. Uh, Wolfhard will return to our screens in the final season of Stranger Things in 2025. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there you go. Interesting, interesting, interesting. All right, Mally, we brought up the question earlier. We're going to answer it now. Why do ghosts wear clothes or sheets instead of appearing in the nude? <laughs> I, You know... I think it's a decent enough question to address just for a time. Right. Uh, there's someone named Shane Mc, McCorstein <laughs> who answers the question. When you think of a ghost, what comes to mind? A ghastly, moldy, winding, or winding sheet, uh, a malevolent pile of supernatural armor, or a sinister gentleman in a, in a stiff Victorian suit? In 1863, George Cruikshank the caricaturist and illustrator of Dickens's novels announced a discovery concerning the varied appearances of ghosts. It does not seem, he wrote, and this is what he wrote, the quote is, uh, that anyone he ever thought of the gross absurdity and impossibility of these being such things as ghosts of wearing apparel, ghosts cannot, must not, dare not, for decency's sake, appear without clothes. And as there can be no such thing as ghosts or spirits of clothes, why then it appears that ghosts never did appear and never can appear. Okay. What? It's, it's, it's Victorian speak. In other words, why can they, why do they appear in clothing when clothing is not ghostly? It's not alive. Mm -hmm. Right. So he asked the question, why aren't ghosts naked? This was a key philosophical question for Cruikshank and many others in Victorian Britain. Instead, stories of naked and closeless ghosts, especially outside folklore, are exceedingly rare. Skeptics and ghost seers alike have delighted in thinking about how exactly ghosts could have form and force in the material world. Just what kind of stuff could they be made of that allows them to share our plane of existence? In all its mundanity. Ooh, that's a good word, mundanity. Uh, the image of the ghost as a figure in a white winding sheet or burial shroud has retained its iconic status for hundreds of years because it suggests a continuity between the corpse and the spirit. The main social role of the ghost before the maiden, or I'm sorry, before the modern period was to carry a message to the living from beyond the grave. So the link to burial clothing makes sense. This can be seen in the medieval trope of the three living and the three dead, whereby some hunters encounter their future skeletal corpses wrapped in linen, admonishing them to remember death. Yet, by the mid-19th century, with spiritualism and early forms of psych psychical research spreading across the Western world, people began to report seeing ghosts dress on, or in every day and contemporaneous clothing. This raised problems for those interested in investigating the reality of ghosts. If the ghost was an objective reality, why would it be wearing clothes? Or why should it be wearing clothes? 
if the tenets of spiritualism were true, should the soul which has returned to visit the earth not be formed of light or some other for- form of ethereal substance? Were the clothes of spirits also spiritual? And if so, did they share in their essence or were they the ghosts of clothes in their own right? I think we're thinking way too hard about this. Uh, yeah. And what about those people that say they have sex with ghosts? Are they, so are they doing it with their shoes on? I mean, I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they gotta be naked. Or, are you okay? Or slippers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slippers. They're keeping their black socks on. Sexy. They're keeping their socks on. Black socks pulled up to the knees. Yeah. You gotta have so sexy. You gotta have some modesty, right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering. I mean, at one point they get naked. Keeping their shoes on. <laughs> I'm just saying. Someone's gotta have a picture. We somewhere. should have one of those people on that are always like in was that the was it the sun or the mirror or whatever that always has the stories about the people that claim they had sex with the ghosts and be like, okay, so was this ghost fully dressed or was it just one sighted? What was it? You know what? I've that'd a, be our topic for a show. I have a psychic coming on in in November. I'm I'm okay, asking. Ask. Her. I'm asking her. <laughs> she claims to be a high power psychic. I'm asking her. Oh. Okay, that that question go. is coming out. We're going to have the <laughs> ghost sex talk. Yes. And what exactly they wear and why mm-hmm. they wear it. And by God, why they're not naked all the time. Yep. And when there's ghost fucking going on, <laughs> I'm just getting True rude about language. it. language. Well, I'm getting rude about it now. Someone's getting passionate. That's right. I don't know. I just, yeah. Just saying. Just saying. Is there ghost lingerie? Is there foreplay? <laughs> okay, now you're going to start getting really kinky. It's getting uncomfortable. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, we've got to ask the questions, right, Mally? Right. I mean, we're, be hitting questions. Yes. We're, we're here in a journalistic <laughs> yeah, role. That's what you want to call it. <laughs> right. We're here to ask the questions and get the More answer. More like sophomoric, but okay. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I am here in a serious journalistic role. Okay. I'm here to get down to the bottom of things. Mm-hmm. Right? I just need to know, right? And it, mm-hmm. and if it is, is there is there one particular company that provides the lingerie for ghosts? Jeez, please. Is it Victoria's Secret? And if so, do they make the bigger sizes for the bigger ghosts? Mm-hmm. Just saying. Do they discriminate on the other side? I need to know. Inquiring minds need to know, Mally. <laughs> You're going to get an email. Uh, I listened to your last show, and I would like to kindly withdraw <laughs> yeah. from my presence on your next episode. <laughs> yep. Uh, Tim, not coming on. Sorry. Yeah. I'll find somebody else. Uh, <clears throat> as far as this clothes or no clothes thing, there was another explanation that ghost seers dress the ghost automatically, though unconscious or through unconscious processes. And so we see a ghost in its usual dress because that's the mental picture we have of the person. And this choice of garment most likely inspires recognition. Okay. So you automatically dress the ghost mm-hmm. with your eyes. <laughs> or undress the ghost with my eyes. <laughs> Um, that's a decent theory. Mm-hmm. I don't mind that. Sure. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a lengthy article, but uh, mm-hmm. I think we can leave it there. They just uh, one last thing. They say the issue of ghost clothes is interesting for historians of the supernatural because, like a loose thread, get it, uh, pulling at it starts to unravel some of the assumptions about the matter in spiritualism. Do ghosts retain the injuries or disabilities that befell them in life and what about Mm -hmm. the erotic fleshiness of spirits the touching and kissing between the living and the dead in the seance room where the ectoplasm gauze like spiritual substance uh, photographed emerging from the orifices of mediums could the living even have sexual intercourse with ghosts that's the that's the big question here 
these kinds of naughty debates, as in a knot in a tree, mm -hmm. have not disappeared in the 21st century. Indeed, spectrophilia or love of ghosts is a fetish that is a lively topic on debate on the internet today. Another turn of the screw in the long history of how spirits matter in the world of the living. It's an interesting article. But, mm -hmm. I, you know, the ghost clothes thing is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. If I'm a ghost and I'm wandering around the earth, I'm not showing up buck, buck naked. It's not happening. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I think every ghost is probably going to be somewhat modest. Right. Yeah. I'd come back and haunt like in my 37 year old body. That was a good year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see, I, if I, I honestly, if I'm coming back, I'm coming, I'm coming back in my 22 year old body. Right. Yeah. A really good year. Yeah. Mm hmm. I had hair then too. Ooh. Yeah. Not the kind that was flapping when you tell that one story. No, no, with not the. the yeah. yeah. <laughs> For the glue. <laughs> no, no, not the rash head. No. No, no, it was Dave who had. Sorry, the, I bring up the past. Dave had the, Dave had the. Dave had the dead dog on his head. It wasn't. <laughs> I thought both of you guys had it like the glue like dripping down. No, no, no. He had the he had the glue dripping down and the dead dog on his head. Okay. And <laughs> he would sit there and he'd try to brush and it would get stuck. <laughs> he didn't he, he didn't know how to really take good care of it. Mine looked like Richard Marks. It was like <laughs> I had the bouffant. Ooh, nice. Oh, mine looked I looked like a movie star baby. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and find my. I had a Valley Fair ID with that hair. Uh -huh. I'm gonna try and find it and show you the picture. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, because it was like I swooped. I mean, my uh -huh. hair swooped. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I nice. had. I had. I had. I had hard rock metal hair because <laughs> it was long in the back and it was. Uh huh. In fact, nice. Um, the only reason I like going to that place was the owner's daughter was hot. Oh my God, she was hot. <laughs> and she used to look at my, my hair piece and she'd say, Oh my God, this is the most well maintained hair piece I've ever seen. <laughs> I was like, You know, and her name was Bobby. And I was like, You know it, Bobby. <laughs> I thought I was, and I'm like, God, there's no way I'm ever scoring with this girl. But I'm like, Yeah, yeah. girl. Yeah. <laughs> Did you work at Valley Fair? No, or was no, it for your had, summer pass? No, we had season passes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you're young and dumb, you think a season pass yeah. to Valley Fair is really cool. Mm-hmm. I don't know what for. <laughs> <laughs> you just go there and ride the rides and you're you're in your early twenties. Uh, what? <laughs> what are you gonna pick up at Valley Fair when you're in your early twenties? Besides a bad back, <laughs> nothing. Oh, Mally, the stupidness of youth. Uh, it was grand. But you know what? <laughs> it was grand, right? But I got on that, I got on those big roller coasters and mine, mm -hmm. mine was like this. Yeah. Right. And it didn't move because I had uh -huh. that thing sprayed down and it was Richard Mark's hair and I was singing, should have known better. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> flying around on, the, on right. the roller coaster. It's like when you watch those movies and they're in a convertible and no one's hair is moving. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> it's like that with you on the roller coaster. It was coasters. helmet hair, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, Dave's on there and there's a dog doing this. <laughs> It's like those those blow up things that are always outside of car dealerships where it's just like swaying. Yes, yeah, it was it was the or, yeah yeah I it, forget what those things are called. Yeah, the little bendy figures. Yeah, yeah that was his toupee. Inflatable bendy figure. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. it was going back and forth in advertising. There was a sail on the top of his head. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, it was fun. It was those fun. were the days. Good times. Good times. <laughs> Yep. Okay, next story. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> yep. A psychic is was looking for a man's re I'm sorry, a psychic was looking for a, still stuck on the <laughs> dog flapping yeah. on the head. Yeah. 
Uh, a psychic looking for a man's missing daughter found human remains this oh. past week. Uh, the psychic discovered the skeletal remains of a person behind a bowling alley, but there was a twist in store. There's a great deal of controversy surrounding the idea that psychics can be used to locate missing people with one side of the fence arguing that they may have a genuine role to play in investigations and the other insisting that psychic abilities don't actually exist. Sometimes, though, psychics actually do find the unfindable, as was the case recently when a psychic who had been tasked with locating a missing man's daughter actually found human remains behind a bowling alley roughly 70 miles from Portland, Maine. 17-year-old Kim Moreau disappeared without a trace all the way back in 1986, and her father, Richard Dick Moreau, had hoped that a psychic might be able to determine her whereabouts. During the session, however, the psychic found something that neither of them had expected. The psychic had a very strong feeling that there was something up there, Moreau told WMUR. But she wasn't sure what it was. Then in about 10 minutes, she turned around, she came down and said, Dick, you've got to get up here now. Incredibly, she had found human bones just a block or so away from the family's home. In an excruciating twist, however, when police came to retrieve the bones, uh, it was determined that they belonged to a male, meaning that it wasn't Moreau's long-lost daughter. It's a disappointment in some ways, he said, but we got to remember and look at it from our point of view. We're one of the families that has a missing loved one. We have a family that's going to get closure now. No, it or so it wasn't us, but one of these times it's got to be. So there you go. They they ended up finding a body. It just wasn't right. the one that they were looking for. Oh, so they ended up helping in one way at least. Mm-hmm. So there you go. And kind of a weird, awkward story, Mel. Okay, scientists have revived pig brains an hour after death with an experimental method. Ew. We're going to talk about whether you should be revived after death. By keeping the livers of Tibetan mini pigs functionally alive, researchers were able to extend the window of brain resuscitation this past month. Scientists in China have pulled off a remarkable feat worthy of Victor Frankenstein, reviving pig brains up to 50 minutes after a complete loss of blood circulation. The macabre accomplishment and someday lead to advances in keeping people's brains intact and healthy for longer while resuscitating them. Nowadays, we can often revive people whose hearts have stopped. The formal term for this is cardiac arrest. But just or, or after just a few minutes of no blood flow, uh, vital organs like the brain are damaged beyond repair. That means that doctors only have a short time or a window to bring someone back without them experiencing, at a minimum, major neurological complications. In this research, published last month in the journal EMBO Molecular Medicine, the scientists sought to extend that window. Gosh, how far do you extend it, though? That's the question. Right. Uh, Past studies have suggested that liver function played a key role in how well the rest of the body does during a cardiac arrest. People with pre-existing liver disease, for instance, seem to have a higher risk of dying from cardiac arrest. So the researchers, based primarily in Sun Yat-sen University, decided to test whether keeping the livers of Tibetan mini pigs functionally alive uh, would have a positive effect on their brain's survivability after resuscitation. All of the pigs had blood flow to their brain stopped, but some were hooked up to a life support system that kept their livers circulation going. The scientists then tried to revive the pig's brain after a certain period of time using the same life support system. Afterward, the pig was euthanized and compared to a control group of pigs that had their blood flow left alone. Now, when the pigs had blood flow to both both organs shut down, their brains were substantially 
more damaged following resuscitation, the researchers found. But the brains of the pigs that had their livers supported tend to fare much better. Interesting. Uh, with fewer signs of injury and a restoration of electrical activity that lasted up to six hours. The researchers were also able to restore activity in these pigs with up to 50 minutes after blood flow to the brain had stopped. Weird. Uh, our study highlights the crucial rule, a role rather, of the liver in the pathogenesis of post-cardiac arrest or brain injury, the researchers wrote. Of course, this doesn't mean that scientists can now return anyone back from the dead perfectly intact and with just a little boost to their liver. There are many damaging bodily changes that occur soon after a cardiac arrest, not just those in the brain and liver. And certainly more research will have to be done to confirm the team's conclusions that the liver is critical to restored brain function. But if this works, or if this work does not continue to pay off, it could someday lead to practical interventions that help improve the odds of successfully resuscitating people. Uh, the insights gained from the current and future studies have the potential to enhance survival and improve uh, outcomes for patients who are experiencing cardiac arrest, said researchers. I don't know what to think as I read the story, Mally. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, you know, it, it depends on what your belief system is. If you're a complete atheist or agnostic, I think you think, well, there's a second chance, right? Mm -hmm. You could be brought back you believe anything else wouldn't you like to think your soul has left your body by then right and if your soul is, is lost it, oh i'm sorry go ahead no 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 i was just gonna say because if they bring you back what if you're not the same what if you're you know your quality of life if you're brought back what if it's worse <clears throat> my thought is this even though it's only 50 minutes and you've brought mm -hmm. you've brought yourself back to life what if that's not your soul what if something is walked in Ooh, you know like it's waiting by your bedside for you to leave and then take over yeah mm. yeah what if that's, that's creepy yeah what what if you've what if you've hollowed out that shell mm -hmm. you've sent like say it let's say it's me all right mm -hmm. let's say you've sent tim to the great beyond mm-hmm that was my time to go, and I went. Right. You've put Beelzebub in Tim's <laughs> shell, and you've created a whole new different problem. Or you've put a, a lower level, lower level demon or a higher level bully in, mm -hmm. in in Tim's shell, and said, "Well, you're fine. We brought you back." And right. whatever is in Tim's shell goes, "Boy, you know what." Yeah. What do you do? Yeah, I didn't think about it that way. There you go. It's your next screenplay or your book to write over the winter time. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That's uh, creepy. Yeah. That yeah. Is, yeah. Just like waiting for you in the hospital. But then. <laughs> What if all hospital rooms had those creepy creatures just waiting for you to leave to take over? But, but then how do you bring back... Okay, so if something walks in, how do you bring mm -hmm. back the original soul? I think if you've already crossed over and your body or what you look at as a shell is already filled up, you can't get back in. That's why I will never try an outer body experience because I'm afraid something's going to walk in and I'll come, come back from after doing my little voyage and I'll be like, uh... <laughs> Why is my body occupied by someone else? <laughs> right. Right. I, I, yeah. Yeah. It, well, you know, and I, speaking mm -hmm. as someone who's gone out of body, not, not purposely, mm -hmm. but has done it. Yeah. It, it's scary as hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're scared the entire time. But I, I don't know how I got back in, mm -hmm. but I got back in. 
Yeah, I, I don't know, Mel. I don't know. It is a scary proposition, but but just the thought of okay, you've you've managed to bring back the body, but did you bring mm-hmm. everything back? Right. It's humans messing with natural processes mm-hmm. that you just go, you know what? No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't Sometimes care. Sometimes advanced science is not a good thing. Right. I, I don't. I don't care how much we miss somebody. Mm-hmm. I can't think that's a good thing. I just can't. Mm-hmm. Our next story has to do with an entrance to the underworld discovered beneath a church in Mexico. Um, the ruins of an ancient city in southern Mexico have yielded evidence of long-lost underground tunnels. Known as a place of the dead, the city of Mitla, or Mitla, built by the ancient Zapotec civilization, was said to be situated atop a labyrinth of underground tunnels and caverns known as the entrance to the underworld. The precise location of these tunnels would go on to be uh, lost to time when the city was raised by the Spanish in the 16th century and new structures were built atop the ruins. For years, archaeologists attempted to find these mysterious sub-channels or subterranean ch- or tunnels, subterranean tunnels, but to no avail. Now, though, thanks to the advent of electrical resistance, resi- <laughs> Let me do this again. Now, though, thanks to the advent of electrical resistive, I can't say the word, resistivity. Is that it? Sure. (laughs) Resistivity tonography. I can get that one, or ERT. Mm -hmm. Uh, Researchers believe that they may have finally located evidence of the Zapotec's enigmatic backdoor to hell. Now, I've seen that movie. That was in the back. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you've just seen it, like the back door to hell. <laughs> the back door to hell. That's in the back of the video section there, uh, back at the uh, Blockbuster, back in the yeah. 90s. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the curtain. Behind the curtain, right. Yeah. You had to, you had to show an ID. <laughs> yeah. I used to show my Valley Fair card because that had such a great picture of me with <laughs> yeah, the Richard Marks there. Your... <laughs> yeah. I'd say, here, look at this they ID. They just use first. it for everywhere. They're like, sir, we didn't ask for your ID. Yeah. I yeah. know, but isn't it great? Yeah. Look at look at my look at my face. Look at my hair in this. This is so cool. <laughs> right. By the way, can I get uh, can I get back door to hell for three or four days? <laughs> you use it as your profile photo if you get on some dating site. <laughs> I tell you, you meet up at like Chili's or something like, uh, that's not what I signed up for. I tell you what, if I can find that ID, I'm going to make it my profile picture on Facebook. There you go. I'm going to, I'm going to put it up as my profile pic on Facebook. <laughs> Just to see if anybody recognizes. Me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to find it, by the way, they scan multiple groups of ruins for signs of the back door to hell. Uh, <laughs> Normally, to find the back door to hell, there's, it's a little more uh, involved. Uh, to find to find this one, though, they scan multiple groups of ruins for signs of subterranean cavities. Some of the tunnels and chambers extended to a considerable depth in excess of 15 meters, said Marco Vigato, founder of the ARCS or ARX project, which is uh, heading up the search. In the case of the South Group, they're up to 30 meters deep. This is as far as the instruments can penetrate. One chamber under the church of the San Pablo Apostle measures approximately 15 meters long by 10 meters wide. It is possible that the tunnels, particularly those under the church group, extend further to the north, east, and south. Possibly they connect to the other geophysical anomalies identified under the other groups. What's particularly exciting is that these tunnels may also contain the burial chambers of the ancient Zapotec, or yeah, I believe it's Zapotec kings and other prominent figures of the Zapotec society. Uh, Whether the treasures were likely buried with, or what, whether the treasures they were likely buried with are still there remains, however, to be seen. So there you go. Um, because you want your treasures buried in your back door. I'm just saying. I, I, <laughs> I have no idea. No clue. All right. Uh, a couple of Bigfoot stories for you as we're starting to close up shop here today. Actually, three of them. 
because uh, we got we got that one in Kentucky to talk about. Okay. Yeah. A political candidate wants to make Bigfoot the state animal of Idaho. Do you think Bigfoot's a big potato fan? <laughs> I just wonder if that's what Bigfoot's, you know, like surviving on. Mm, bunch of starch, like the rest of us. Oh, yeah. Likes a good baked potato, <clears throat> you know, just mm-hmm. throws it in the microwave. It just hits the potato setting. <laughs> I've discovered the potato setting on the on the microwave. Mm. By the way, it's it's a great setting. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried it, but I, I, it's new to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, you, know, you just you fry up a little steak on the Ninja Grill. You hit the potato button mm-hmm. on the microwave. I'm an idiot, but I love it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. A uh, challenger in the upcoming battle of Idaho's District 16 state representative seat is pushing a rather unusual policy. Enticing the electorate to vote for you is usually a case of outlining what improvements you're looking to make, what your political policies are, and how you are a better candidate than your opponent. For Republican challenger Chandler Stewart Hadraba, however, there is one particular issue in mind that you would seem to be rather low on most people's priority lists. Not for Hadraba, however. He's running against incumbent Democratic candidate Sonia Galaviz in the race for Idaho's District 16 state representative seat and wants to make the state's or wants to make the state the country's top destination for Bigfoot tourism. What is the top state for Bigfoot tourism? I would think like Pennsylvania, maybe. Maybe Pennsylvania or Alaska, one or the other. Right. Oregon. I don't know. I really want to make Idaho number one for Bigfoot tourism, he said. I think this is a creative way to have our rural communities and remote areas benefit more from tourism in such a great state. Hadrava even wants to take things a step further by making Bigfoot the official state animal of of, of Idaho, not Ohio, but Idaho, (laughs) and by introducing tags allowing the cryptozoological bipeds to be legally hunted. He had me until that. Yeah. Yeah. All of this, he argues, will bring more tourism revenue to rural parts of the state. Uh, While this is certainly a unique approach, it's unclear whether or not such a policy will sway voters. I don't know if you're a voter in in Idaho Valley. Do you vote for hunting Bigfoot? (laughs) Uh, I don't know. I can't see it. I really can't see it. <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, okay, the tourism thing is one thing, right? Right. I understand that. But, you know, let's go shoot Bigfoot. I don't, I don't know that that's a, yeah. that's a thing you, you run on. All right. We're going to get into this thing they call the big white thang in okay. Kentucky. And I'm, okay, so have you ever been near burksville kentucky i don't think so in cumberland county well, i've been to cumberland area like the falls and stuff cumberland falls okay but i don't i don't know if that's in the vicinity of cumberland county okay well let's uh let's paint the picture for you and you can you can see this comes from wkd wdky i'm sorry in uh in mm-hmm. lexington Big white thangs is what they call them. The Hainton Holler Cryptid was seen near a Kentucky highway. We go to Burksville, Kentucky, where this little stretch in Kentucky could be one of the scariest places in America. The hotbed of paranormal activity is said to be located on Kentucky Highway 3115 or 3115, just past Gray Gap Road in Cumberland County. Called the Hainton Holler by the locals, the stretch of road is home to numerous scary sightings from a headless horseman to big white fangs. That's in quotes, <laughs> big white fangs. I got a couple of big white fangs. I mean, <laughs> according to haunted history of Kentucky, a haint is an, a haint is like a taint with an H. Mm-hmm. That's all I got to say. That's how it's spelled anyways. Right. A, a haint is an old Southern word for a specific type of ghost or evil spirit found 
in stories from all over the South. The white things are said to look like an albino Bigfoot. Specific details vary from person to person. HHK noted how some witnesses claimed that white things walked on all fours, climbed trees, and waited to pounce on unsuspecting victims below. Other accounts suggest that the creature would walk on two legs and have a haunting scream. Well, that sounds lovely. <laughs> My kind of cryptid. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite earlier stories, HHK said that most claim that the white thing is not dangerous, but its screams still frighten those who hear them. They are said to range from the sound of a woman or a baby crying to sounding more like a partner. What partner <laughs> screams like that? I know, right? At random. <sighs> it's not a partner I'd want to be with for very long. <laughs> yeah. You go deaf. Yeah, right. <laughs> Eyewitness accounts claim that the white things stand between eight to nine feet tall. And some claim that the creatures have no eyes and no ears. That according to HHK. Others have said that white things resemble a bear with the head of a lion and red eyes. Hmm. Okay, that in itself is a little creepy. It's said that the temperature drops 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit while inside the Hainton Holler, but temperatures are normal everywhere else. And with that, it says, Happy Halloween. Hmm. Hainton Holler sound like a place you want to be? <laughs> I don't think so. No, not after hearing. I mean, I do love the state of Kentucky, but I don't think I want to run into hate and holler. No, not me either. I think I'm good. Got another place that probably isn't somewhere you want to end up. Turns out it's a quote unquote friendly little zoo. Okay. Uh, The zoo, meanwhile, is asking for help identifying a mystery creature with wings and horns. Hmm. We go to the Bristol Zoo. The Bristol Zoo Project recently captured a trail camera image of a strange creature with some unusual features. When an animal is so strange that even a zoo has trouble figuring out what it is, you know you're onto something unusual. Unless, that is, it has been posted up as a challenge tongue-in-cheek to the Halloween season. Which of these two possibilities is most likely? We'll leave up to you, of course. The photograph, which was posted up yesterday on the Facebook page of the Bristol Zoo, Connecticut, shows a a peculiar mammal that seems to have horns on its head and a set of wings on its back. Have you seen the recent news about a mysterious winged and horned creature being spotted at the Bristol Zoo Project team member wrote? Uh, Our conservation team uses camera traps to survey the ancient woodland on our site Here you can see a familiar muntjac deer Mm -hmm. alongside a creature that has us just a little stumped. So what exactly could this animal be? In all likelihood, the wings are actually a photographic anomaly, meaning that the mysterious creature is also likely a muntjac deer, a common species found in the region. Nonetheless, the image has certainly garnered a lot of attention over the last few days. So here, Mally, with that, I will show you the picture here. See, to me, I'll, okay, I know what I think this is. I'll show, uh-huh. you, I'll show you the black and white. Here's, here's the black and white. Okay. What do you think that is? Looks, huh? I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Not sure? Yeah, I'm not sure. What do you think it is? Okay, now that I see it, I honest to God think it is, I think it's a doe, a baby deer. Okay, I was thinking a baby deer. Mm -hmm. And the thing on its back Mm -hmm. isn't, I don't think it's it's anything on its back at all. I think... Do these movement? No, I think it's another head. I think it's it's honestly it's a conjoined twin. Oh. If you look, that looks like another set of ears. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. 
like maybe it it was a, a failed twin in the womb. Mm -hmm. You know, like like yeah. maybe the ears and the in the head were grown into the spine somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, poor dear. You know. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, hmm. and let me see if there's a better picture, like a daylight picture of this thing. Because they have a trail cam. When you see the just the side profile, mm -hmm. you don't see horns, do you? Right. No, not at all. Okay. So, hmm. I'm convinced that that's what that is. Those aren't horns at all. Yeah. Tell you what, we'll post this in the description of the program as well, so you can take a look at this this creature with supposed horns. It's pretty interesting. So, hmm. yeah. All right. Final story today, Mel. Also okay, has okay. to do with a creature. A creature that we didn't invite to our Halloween party. <laughs> I don't know. You have big plans for Halloween? I know we, we kind of talked about this before. Right. Uh, just uh, passing out candy and stuff like that. Just enjoying the, enjoying the day. Trying to take it all in. It's supposed to be a little chilly here, but I like watching the kids come up and and mm -hmm. uh, trick or treat. I, I actually i i participated this past weekend in a trick or treat, or actually it was a trunk or treat. Okay. Um, uh, event over in Coon Rapids, over at a mall. Mm -hmm. I think. It okay. Was, is it Coon Rapids Square Mall? I don't remember which which it was. Um, and it, it was right after the Anoka Halloween Parade let out. Oh, okay. So there were a couple thousand kids there. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, none of the trunk or treaters were prepared to have that many kids there. Right. So you guys ran out of candy? Multiple times. Uh, um, what's nice is that the organizer kept bringing in candy for everybody. Oh, nice. But we went through bag after bag after bag after mm -hmm. bag after bag after bag. And eventually it was supposed to go from like two to six. They had, okay. to they had to shut down at 4.45. Gotcha. Because there was just no more candy in the area. Right. Which is too bad because, you know, kids, kids mm -hmm. show up and they, they want to go trunk or treating, right? Right. Um, that's the only thing I think that could ruin your Halloween. Mm -hmm. It's just running out of candy for these poor kids. Yeah. yeah. But they're having a blast. And, and some of the costumes are just amazing. Mm -hmm. Really, they're just amazing costumes. That's my favorite part of Halloween, just seeing the kids having fun. And, yeah. You know, the different costumes. And boy, mm -hmm. the kids were so polite this year, too. They really so were. So good. Yeah, they were just so polite and so nice. That, it's, that was Aww. a huge part of it. Well, one kid wasn't so nice when it came to Halloween decorations at one house. Oh, there's always the one. That's right. We go to North Carolina where a woman's doorbell camera captured video of a trio of black bear cubs making a meal out of her family's Halloween pumpkins and Amazon packages. <laughs> the video shows what unfolded when the three young Bruins approached Aaron Chester's front door in Asheville. Oh, it's not like they haven't had problems up there either. Mm -hmm. God, no, double whammy. Yeah. The bears tore through Chester's Amazon packages before turning their attention to the pumpkins placed on the stoop as Halloween decorations. See, this is why I won't, I won't use real pumpkins anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, two of the bears wrestle for ownership of a pumpkin, while the third bear enjoys another gourd by itself. The video ends with one of the bears carrying the remaining pumpkin away as a to-go snack. <laughs> That's cute. No. What happens if they're lit and they eat the lit candle? <laughs> Just uh, bears have been known in the past to go for food or go looking for food on front porches. A hungry bear was famously caught on camera last year stealing a Taco Bell delivery from the front door of an Orlando, Florida <laughs> home. I think we covered that one, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing the photo. Yeah. Or the little video thing, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, i tell you what. The video of this is is too funny, so we'll we'll post this one as well. We got quite a bit to post in today's show up on the description of the website or description of the show 
Uh, so you got a few videos to watch today, so you can you can uh, rifle through those and see some videos here. All right, with that, uh, Mally, what's new on ParanormalGirl.com? Uh, just check it out. I've got some uh, stories. I'm going to write about the Lynnhurst Mansion that I went to when I was in Sleepy Hollow uh, area. And, uh, yeah, just kind of enjoy enjoy uh, the season, the Halloween season. Right. So, on. Right on. Yep. Um, let's see, on this end... Um, I'm trying to think. Mm, look at that Halloween thing coming up on Thursday tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's a big day, really big day. Mm, what are we going to do? Oh yeah, we got a Halloween show tomorrow. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Christopher Jordan is in tomorrow. We're going to talk about the history of Halloween. Very cool. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the customs of Halloween. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about all kinds of things Halloween. It's a big show tomorrow, Mally. Huge show with Christopher Jordan tomorrow. Very cool. Yeah. So we got some great Halloween. It's great Halloween listening as you're uh, getting the kids ready to go trick-or-treating. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, I almost said so you can tie them up. Uh, that wasn't <laughs> what I meant. Uh, so you can get the... <laughs> You can get them cinched up in their costumes and get their extra mm -hmm. layers on, especially if you're here in Minnesota, and uh, and get them cinched up and ready to go out and uh, maybe scare them a little bit about where that tradition of putting them in costumes and, and going out and begging for candy came from, because mm -hmm. you'll learn about that in tomorrow's show. Very cool. Yeah, there's lots of things you'll learn about in tomorrow's show as to where our customs come from. So that's all coming up tomorrow with Christopher Jordan. So I'm looking forward to it. There you go. One more reminder, folks, as we leave you today, that uh, you have until Sunday, Sunday, November 3rd at midnight to enter into this contest to win two tickets to the Ghost Stories, Inc. ghost hunt up at the Palmer House in Sauk Center, Minnesota. This is the way you do it. You can enter by emailing. You email your name, your address, your phone number, and the phrase that pays. I want to ghost hunt with Tim and Jess. Do that uh, by Sunday, November 3rd at midnight, and you'll be entered for a chance to win two tickets. Now, by the way, you do have to buy your hotel room for that, that time frame, November 14th to mm -hmm. the 17th. Um, but you do get the two admission tickets. To get into the event. I highly encourage you to do this. Highly encourage you to do this and get it in early. I know it's a busy week coming up. Busy week. Mm -hmm. Halloween. All this other stuff. But if you want to get in on this, it's going to be a wonderful trip. It's a 1920s themed trip. And the way that Ghost Stories Inc. does it, it's not just going up there and ghost hunting for a few days. And then you're sitting mm -hmm. around looking at the ceiling. It's nothing like that. It's a lot of good times, camaraderie. There is, there's a theme to it, the 1920s theme to it. So make sure you bring either a flapper dress or you find a zoot suit. Um, there's art projects and different things that they'll be doing up there, different workshops. It's an amazing time. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you come out and join us for it as well, November 14th through the 17th. Get your entry in now. Again, to jessica at jessicafreeberg.com. That's who you're going to email jessica at jessicafreeberg.com with your name, your address, your phone number, and the phrase that pays, I want to go with Tim and Jess or Jess and Tim, one of the other. <laughs> Get it in right now. All right, so that's going to do it for today. We'll see you tomorrow for Christopher Jordan and the history of Halloween right here on the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio.